This past week has been perhaps one of the most intense so far this year with respect to fabrication, or at least with respect to welding. I feel like I've been working nonstop for the last seven or eight days to make progress on this car, but I'm feeling pretty good about it at the moment. I have accomplished two things over the last week. The first is progress. There have been a lot of jobs that I thought would be small and would only take a little bit of time, and they've blown up to be big jobs that took a bunch of time, but we can cross a ton of stuff off the list in this episode, the most in a long time. The car is more or less completely assembled behind me and ready to set down on the ground. The second accomplishment so far this week is honestly a sense of fulfillment. Every time I have sat down at the workbench to weld, I have been excited to do it and I feel like I'm getting better and better every time. The TIG welding process is something I have gotten to fall in love with and I'm excited to talk about that a little bit. I want you guys to make sure you give it a shot if it's something you're interested in doing. I thought I'd never get the hang of it and here I am loving every second of it and that's the whole point of building cars like this. Anyways, enough blabbering. We've got a lot of parts to build in this episode and a lot of parts to install, so let's get to it. Every good episode begins with a fresh box of parts, and believe it or not, in these boxes from Send Cut Send, there's a full week's worth of parts to build. The last several episodes showcase the process of designing these parts, so let's get them opened up and see what we have to work with. As always, we've got a slew of precision laser cut flat pieces, but this time around we've also got some pre-bent pieces thanks to Send Cut Send's bending services. It'll make work easier on our end as we build upper and lower shock mounts, toe link mounts, and more. With a ton of welding ahead of me, I decided to start with something easy, the toe link mounts. But because this stuff is made with 3 16 hot rolled steel, we need to clean all of the mill scale and kerfing off of the edges. For this job, I'm using the 3M deburring wheel I've showcased in a number of episodes already, but as always, it's doing the job without a hitch. Everything is primed and ready for TIG welding, so it's time to clamp everything into place, square it all up, and get it burned in. Lately, I've been sticking with 3 seconds lanthanated tungsten paired with 16th filler rod, and while I get great penetration, I also get really nice puddle control. I'm no pro yet, but my welds seem to be getting better every time I sit down at the bench. However, these toe link boxes are going to be the last parts that we install in this episode, so I'll show you how they work here in a bit. Now, one of my favorite parts about designing parts in Fusion 360 is that at any point I can open them up from my phone. For the next part, it's a helpful refresher to know exactly how our brackets need to be oriented on our control arm for our lower shock mount. Having send cut send pre-bend these tabs can save us a lot of work on the front end, but that's only if you remember to tell them to bend the tabs in opposite directions for opposite sides of the car. I'm not saying that I forgot, but here I am bending some the other way for fun, of course. And as luck would have it, I overbent them just a bit. But because I'm a perfectionist and I want these to be spot on, we're going to head over to the arbor press and unbend them just a smidge, using a round tube placed directly over the bend. If we give this a bit of a squeeze with a few tons of force, it'll unbend without any damage to the part, and now my control arms will be a lot closer to identical side to side. Now if you guys are enjoying the video, leave a like, or leave a comment if you've got some thoughts to share. Of course, if you haven't subscribed yet, you should. I want you to be here for when we get this car done, and it's only a matter of time. I spent some serious time getting both rear upper control arms totally burned in, and then I moved to the front lower control arms for the other lower shock mounts. Now, some of you guys are undoubtedly asking, what are these blocks that you see everywhere? And I've shown them before, but as a refresher, these are one, two, three blocks. I've been told by Adam Savage that these are a machinist's best friend, and I have to say I do find myself using them quite a bit. I'm using them here because they are precision machined to three dimensions. One side measures one inch, another measures two, and the final side measures three inches exactly. I design all of my parts in CAD with these dimensions and blocks in mind to make fabrication easier. For example, these shock tabs are meant to be two inches apart exactly, so I just drop a block between them. The result is parts that are straight, as long as you don't warp anything while you weld it. My welding here came out quite nice, I'm pleased with it, and the control arms at this point are now considered done. That concludes the lower shock mounts, both front and rear, and all that's left is to fabricate the upper shock mounts for the back of the car. I did those off camera, and as with everything else, I'm quite happy with the outcome, but most importantly, what I think is cool is that this goes to show if you learn Fusion 360, literally anyone can make parts that look this good at home thanks to Send Cut Send. 
All right, last but not least, if we want the car to support its own weight, there has to be some form of suspension in it, like a coilover. Now, I don't have our coilovers from H&R yet. I do have the coilovers off of the Model A, and the fronts are almost identical in size. They would technically bolt in and work, but I've only got two of them, so we're gonna need a different solution. So what we're gonna do is make our own. We're going to make some temporary turnbuckles like this that we can bolt into place that'll hold the car up until we get our coilovers from Germany. To make these turnbuckles, I'm using the same DOM tubing that we used for our control arms, and I'm pairing those with threaded tube inserts and rod ends. At the moment, it seems like all four corners of the car will have a coilover that is exactly the same in overall length, but I've only measured the front to be sure. So those will get fully welded while the rears get tacked in place just in case I need to change them. Each turnbuckle will get a 5 8 inch rod end at each end, one right hand and one left hand thread for adjustability. We'll also use misalignment spacers to drop the imperial rod ends down to metric hardware so that all of the bolts on the car remain metric. And speaking of misalignment spacers, Brett finally finished the other 16 that we will need in order to fully install our control arms. With these in hand, it's time to set our sights on final assembly. Now while I put this stuff together real quick, a note about the aluminum turnbuckles that I made for the steering in the last episode. Several, if not a bunch of you guys left comments saying that you thought it was absolutely insane to use aluminum for a steering part like this, that this stuff is not up to such a load heavy task, that it will fatigue, so on and so forth. Not really important. Previously, I would have argued because if you hop on any Circle Track Supply website, you're gonna find nothing but aluminum turnbuckles. It's a very common material for this job. It's what's on the Model A. It's on tons and tons and tons of cars. With that said, I don't know everything. I, half the time, I don't even know what I'm talking about. So instead of taking a risk, since you guys seem to think this is a bad idea, I will heed your advice and I bought some steel hex bar stock. I'm going to remake them out of steel so that everybody can uh, rest easy knowing that the steering pieces on this thing won't fail. Maybe something else probably will, but these won't. I had some fears that all of the welding on the control arms to add these shock mounts would have warped or distorted them, but thankfully they slid into place and fit just as well as they always have. It wouldn't be genuine to say that they didn't warp at all as I didn't clamp them down, but it seems like we kept all of the warping well under control. With the control arms in place, the brake and spindle assembly can be installed, and then you can knock your light off of the car, leaving you completely unable to see what you're doing, and I need to address this, so bear with me for a moment. These Milwaukee magnetic lights. I bought them because they are small and bright, and that's pretty cool. And they have a magnet on them, which should make them pretty good for situations like this. They can hold themselves up. Or at least, I think that they're supposed to, but the magnets on these are the worst, most useless things ever. It bugs me a lot. It, look at this. This here is the side of my toolbox and things stick to it no problem, including the light. And you would think that's pretty useful, except let's, uh, let's see if it can withstand a quarter dropping on it. That's all the force it takes to knock this magnet off. So if you're trying to light your workspace, it takes no force. Now look, I love Milwaukee products. I think that they're great. I have way too much money invested in the Milwaukee system. They've got me, I'm hooked. These need improvement. If you're thinking about buying them, make sure you decide if the magnet situation is going to work for you. I have two of them and they're the same, so. All right, back to that install. I wrapped up the install off camera and while we've seen most of these parts on the car before, the exciting part at the moment is that for once there's no jack stand underneath them holding them up. The real interesting bits are behind the brake rotor, so let's take a closer look. Now I want to get in here with the small camera just to show it off because I am excited. We do have steering. We can actually turn the wheels with the steering wheel. You guys saw that in the last episode. We've got our upper control arms in place, our lower control arms in place, ball joints, everything connected to the spindle. We've got brakes, hubs, rotors, all that jazz. And we have our lower coilover mount. 
and it is attached to the factory upper coilover mount. We're using this rod as a temporary coilover, and what's cool is we can actually adjust the height by just rotating it. If we reach in here and turn it, by turning the rod, it'll actually thread these in and out since we have uh, right-hand threads and left-hand threads at the top. So pretty easy height adjustment as we kind of fine-tune this thing, get everything working the way we want. I am jazzed to say the least. All right, so we're back in the fender well. And as I showed you guys before, this is the original shock mount. We're not gonna use it. Instead, we've got it set up as a cross brace in the engine bay. Instead, we're gonna mount our new shock mount right here in this junction. It's a little bit better lined up for what we need and a bit more structure here. Now we drew this mount in a previous episode. So now that we've got it made, it's just a matter of putting it into place. It'll do something like that right there. So we need to get all of this paint ground off, get everything cleaned up, and we need to do a little bit of welding before we put our part in place. So let's get to it. This time around, it's a 3M clean and strip wheel on the die grinder, and it's making quick work of the original undercoating and primer on the car. With the metal cleaned up and the shock mount mocked up into place, it's time to play the old game of operating the TIG pedal with my thigh while I weld overhead. Several of you guys have suggested that I buy a TIG button for instances like this, which would make this a lot easier to do, and it's definitely on my to-do list, but it's not something that I've done yet, obviously. While on the driver's side of the car, I finally mounted that upper control arm mount that we've been missing this entire time. We're going to need it in order to mount the suspension to this side of the car. I then turned my attention to where we're going to be mounting our toe link mount. These were the first part that we welded in the episode, and as you can see, I cut the back of it off and added a bevel so that it'll seat properly against the metal and move the mounting hole closer to the chassis. That'll get that mount in line with the upper and lower control arm pivot points and should help us completely eliminate bump steer at the back of the car. However, for now, I'm only gonna tack weld these into place just in case they need modification. Dialing in that bump steer to be perfect is gonna take a little bit of work. And now for a look at the final result. I've got all of the pieces installed at the back of the car as well, including our turnbuckles in place of our coilovers. I've also got a complete tow link set up in place, which has our rear wheels locked in position. So let's take a closer look. All right, and a quick glance in here with the small camera. We've got our upper shock mount welded into place, nice and sturdy. And we've got our upper control arm with the lower shock mount on it now. Everything is nice, lines up well, everything looks like it should, which is good. And then down below, we've got our tow link. We've got the mount on the inside added in. We've got the arm on the spindle. We can actually turn this tow link in order to adjust our tow. And with a little bit of adjustment, this will keep everything from bump steering in the back, which is ideal. I'm really excited this is all coming together and it's ready to get it weight set on it. So there's still a few things we need to do before we actually pull the dolly out from underneath this thing. But again, the beauty at the moment is the fact that there are no longer any jack stands under the car holding the suspension up. It's now suspended from the car. More importantly, that means once there are wheels and tires on this thing, those will hold the car up. The suspension won't cycle at the moment, but that's not really important right now. All right, so with that, all of the pieces are on the car for the first time. We've got upper and lower control arms on all four corners for the first time ever, which is a pretty big milestone. We've got upper control arm mounts in the back for the first time. We've got upper coilover mounts installed. We've got tow links, we've got tie rods. Everything is in place, everything's hooked up. This thing is pretty much ready to set down on its own weight for the first time. Now, I don't have wheels yet, so we're gonna use jack stands, but we can still pull the dolly out from underneath this thing, and I'm really excited to do that. This has been a long time coming. That might sound not that exciting, but promise. That might not sound insane to you guys, but it is to me. This is a huge moment. It means that once the wheels show up, we can actually bolt them on, set this thing down, and roll it around. Now, I am waiting on a couple of pieces, otherwise I would just do that in this episode. That'd be a fun place to end it, but I don't have all of the misalignment spacers that I need, and without them, I can't make sure that all of our parts and pieces aren't gonna move around. And I don't have nuts for the upper ball joints. I don't wanna put this thing on its own weight without making sure those ball joints are properly tightened down, or the control arms will slack and the whole thing could come apart, and I don't want that. That's not a good thing. 
So what we're planning on is for Tuesday's episode to be dragging this car out, putting it in the mall shop, and we'll set it down on jack stands for the first time and pull the dolly out. In the interim, I'm gonna get some parts ordered, and then I'm gonna fly to Georgia, take some time, enjoy some time with some friends, go to a car show, it should be a good time. But when I come back, we're gonna make some more progress, and once it's off the dolly, that means it can go on the lift. Once John gets his V across down, we can get it on the lift, we can start installing all of the uh, underbody aero, just keep crossing things off the list. So I'm excited for it. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I'm kind of bummed not to end it kind of at a finish line, at a milestone. Pretty much every episode kind of ends with a punctuating point. And this one kind of doesn't feel like it has one. Although, like I said, all the parts are on the car. So I guess that's worth something. Anyways, I'll quit rambling. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Thank you as always for the support and I will catch you guys on Tuesday next week.